it, it, will, it will work out. Um, so, perspective on, on accessibility today, but first uh, let me introduce myself. I am Martin Falken, I'm from the developer at Dictu, though I'd like to sneak in as much time as I can in my daily job to be an advocate for accessibility. Um, Dictu uh, is Dienst ICT and Uitvoering, one of the largest IT service providers for the government. Uh, 1,800 professionals in total with offices in The Hague, Volle and Assen. Uh, and my team, the Web and App Services, consists of 19 people. Uh, some of them are here in the room <laughs> with us. Uh, eight Drupal teams, two app teams, and one separate UX team. Uh, we, we have, we're having a little bit of trouble with people not knowing who Dictu is, uh, but I'm pretty sure you know what we make, because you might know us from Telekamer.nl, Consuwijzer, DigiD, uh, Justus, RVO.nl, some of the big government websites. Uh, so that's for an introduction. Uh, now an introduction of why I'm giving this talk. Uh, a few years ago, a few years ago, I uh, found out about a British illusionist called Darren Brown. I don't know if you heard of him. Um, but I got into his YouTube videos, really amazing stuff. I, I even bought his book. And his book has nothing to do with accessibility, except for a little part in the preface where he, uh, where he writes that he went to the aquarium in London. And as he walks past all those fish things, um, he notices that the name of the fish that's in the thing uh, is not only written in, in English, but also in Braille for uh, officially impaired people. Um, and he thinks, well, that's, that's actually a nice accessible aquarium, until he walks further and starts thinking like, wait a minute. So if a officially impaired person goes to this aquarium and he uses the Braille naming tags and he leaves the aquarium again, then all he has is a list of fish and nothing more. And this example, among many others, is the reason I'm giving this talk. It happens all the time that we see accessibility uh, as a legal requirement or a corporate policy. Or we do it as an afterthought, like, look, we're accessible, but we don't really think about it. I'm going to give you another example. And though I've been doing this talk a few times now, this one is a bit difficult because my grandfather died two weeks ago, but I kept it in because it's a good example. Uh, these are my grandparents, Hank and Dina. Um, for the past few years, um, my grandfather's mobility started to deteriorate, became lesser and lesser, and he would more often than not be in a wheelchair. So at one day he had to go to the city hall to pick something up. They couldn't send it to him, he had to pick it up in person. So as good and as bad as it went, he got into the car with my grandmother and drove to City Hall. But coming there, he was still really tired of getting in the car, so he couldn't get out and get inside. So my grandmother goes inside and asks, like, can I pick it up for him, because he's outside in the car. But it wasn't possible. Then she asked, like, maybe can you come with me outside to bring it to him? But no, he had, he had to come inside to actually collect it. So in a last effort, she asked, perhaps you have a wheelchair available for situations like this. But they didn't. So, short, long story short, he went home without getting what he went to the city hall for, which ironically was a handicapped parking car. Um, and I think at this point in time, uh, we all know making accessible websites is really important. And I also believe that we all try to work really hard on that. So what I could have done today is tell you something about uh, WCAG guidelines and how you should do headings and, and, and what color contracts you should do, how to make accessible forms. And you would all listen to me and maybe even pick up a thing or two that you didn't know yet, but at the end you would walk out of here with not much more than a list of fish. Um, so instead I'm going to show you a few examples of uh, what happens when we see accessibility as an afterthought, as some extra, something we just do on the side. Um, because I think that's the biggest problem that we face today with accessibility. Not that we don't do it, because we do, but we do the bare minimum, the legally required stuff to make our website successful. Um, I'm going to take you through some offline um, accessibility solutions that show you what I mean. Um, let's start with Grail on a rough wall. So we added it, nobody's going to find it. I'll wait for the picture. 
<laughs> um, or drill for really long children on this inclusive playground that nobody will ever find because it's way too high. Printed sign language, because deaf people can't read, apparently. <laughs> and 90% of the wheelchair ramp, because the last 10% was too expensive or something, I don't know. And the last one, and I don't even know what this is, it must be a wheelchair ramp, gym or something. Um, it also happens a bit closer to home. Uh, I currently work uh, for a project for RV OpenML, the website. They have an office in The Hague, a really modern one, like all government buildings are. Uh, and they have this hyper-modern elevator system where you don't go walk into the elevator and just press the floor button you need to know there is a fancy touchpad. But they also figured out that the touchpad is not really accessible for visually impaired uh, people. So what they did is they added a, I hope you can see it with all the light, uh, one single button below there with a wheelchair logo with Braille on it. And I'm curious because I'm standing in front of the elevator. So like, how, how does it work? One button for all the floors. So naturally, I pressed it. And then a, a really soft voice, barely audible, tells me uh, how many floors there are in the building, which at RVO are like from minus two to 17. So she just states the numbers. Then she tells me, like, press once for every floor to go up. And then when you get at your required floor, you hold the button and the elevator will come. So I press it and it says minus two. And I press it again and it says minus one. And it goes from zero to one to five, so to two to three to four to five. Not to six because apparently that's a restricted floor I didn't know about. So it goes from five straight to seven. So I'm at seven. I want to go to seven. I hold the button and according to the instructions, I should go to the seventh floor, right? Wrong. Right. Because I went to eight. Um, when it comes to digital accessibility, we also see these problems. Uh, we see the minimum effort we sometimes put into it because, right, we have to, it's a legal requirement or company policy states it, so we do it. We don't really know why we do it, but we do it. Um, an accessibility expert once called this paper accessibility, and I think that really describes it. You are accessible on paper. At the moment, we get a nicely made report from one of the WCAG agencies that tells us all the tested pages, not all pages, all the tested pages, comply to the standards, and we will call our website accessible. At the government, we even get like a nice statement, which is uh, when you completely comply, you get the status A, it says complies completely, and you get this image to put on your website. Just let it sink in that this, this entire thing is an image. It consists 90% of text, but it's an image. You put this on your website, and that's it. For the, and, and, and I'm sounding a bit sarcastic here, because this is exactly what I'm talking about. We have on our website, we have a page dedicated to digital accessibility, where we say that we comply completely to the standards, and we do. But nobody stopped to think, and look at this picture and say, like, this picture with 90% text on it, this is the best solution to show that we're accessible. Um, because if you can read, that's fine. If you can't read this and you're using screen reader, there, it will have an alternative text that says, click here to go to, our, uh, to another website that opens the accessibility statement where you read it. So instead of just staying on the website you are on, you are forced to click open another website, read the statement, then close the website again to go back to the site where you were. Um, so, one of the examples, like, we don't think about it, we do it because we have to. So we got our accessibility statement, we tried our best, uh, we got ourselves an accessible website, and basically, for a year, we're now fine. Sure, um, we should, have all changes checked again. Nobody really does that. And we are only forced to review our website after a year. So for a year, we can say we have an accessible website. Um, and that's kind of where it goes wrong, because the moment you release your website, within a week, there will be changes. New content will be added, maybe colors will be changed, 
images will be will be put on there. Um, so within a week, the website will not be accessible anymore. But we can still say it's accessible because we've got our statement, um, and 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 for here we don't have to do anything. Uh, a nice example for this is actually digitoegankelijk.nl because you saw statements from digitoegankelijk. They call the status A. They comply completely. Uh, but on digitoegankelijk, um, web uh, editors, of content editors, um, also have the possibility to make. Uh, blocks in Drupal on their website. And they also have the possibility to actually pick the background color. So they can just select a color, they can add a block, and after they got the status A, one of the editors put this block on it. And it looks pretty accessible until you hover over one of the links. So within a few months, and this is actually one of our websites, so we should, we should fix it. <laughs> Within a few months, it's not completely accessible anymore, but we can still say for a year on paper, we're accessible. Um, have we spent some more time and effort on this? Maybe get the content editors to teach them something about accessibility or what they actually should pay attention to. Uh, or maybe write some fail savers in our front end. Maybe even use or make a Drupal module that actually checks in the back end already if the color they pick is accessible or not and prevent them from even showing it. Another good example of paper accessibility are the alternative text you get as images. We all know every image should have an alternative text for screen readers. Uh, we it get checked whether there is an alternative text. But what we forget to check is whether the text we actually wrote for it makes sense for the image we wrote it for. Um, imagine you're li living in Demon. I don't know if anyone is from Demon. Um, but you are officially impaired and you really want to know what the dimensions of your waste containers are. You go to their website. Sorry, it's in Dutch. I normally give it in Dutch. And I think most of you are Dutch. <laughs> most will be able to read it. Um, so how big are the containers? This is a promising start. Then you scroll down and you get to this image. It says dimensions container 8 liters. Now before I go to the solution demon chose, I really want to ask you what you would put here for an alt text. For somebody who can think about it. Probably dimensions in height, width, and depth. Sounds like a great solution. Demon went for this. <laughs> uh, Rotterdam does us one better. Two black containers with residual waste sticker and dimensions next to it. So I'm visually impaired. And I'm really happy to know that at least the dimensions are in the picture. I don't know what they are. I will never find out what they are. But at least they are there. So writing alternative text is really hard. Um, Trying to decipher that as a visual impaired person is probably even harder. Um, so I think one of the problems that digital accessibility um, faces is that websites are written by people that don't have these impairments, or most of the time don't have these impairments that the users actually do have some of them. Um, so we know what the minimum requirements are for accessibility, we follow them, but we don't know how an impaired visitor actually experiences our website. And that's why I'd like to invite you to do an exercise with me today. Uh, try to experience a little bit of how it is to not be able to see images, but actually have to work uh, based on the information somebody else ga uh, gives you. Now this is going to be with Lego, so we're going to play with Lego today. Uh, it's going to be pretty hectic because I'm going to give each pair uh, a Lego set. There are 24. I hope it will all work out. If you have any problem with attention, keeping attention, or lots of sounds, please come to me. We have an extra room back there where it's going to be a bit quieter. So if you think like, no, I, I have ADHD, uh, autism, something like that, there is a room for you so you can do the. Um, the challenge uh, without the noise or the attention loss. Um, 
Anemi, do you want to help me with actually <laughs> spread out some Lego? So what the goal is, I'm going to give each of your pairs the front one. I'm going to give the front one. Yes. Oh, 
striving to do something when it can't seem to handle for itself. So it's basically an uh, exercise to experience how visually impaired people are, uh, are kind of working uh, uh, with manuals and with texts that are written for them instead of reading it themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the purpose of the Lego Challenge? So the purpose of the Lego Challenge is to uh, experience how it's like for vision of the people to work with texts that are written for them instead of uh, reading it, being able to read it themselves. So you get to experience how it's like to create some entity uh, that helps you to get better access for themselves. Um, yeah. That was it? <laughs> <laughs> Ja, om de spot ook even, ja, ja precies. Ja, fijn dat je nog een keer moet doen. De tweede keer is dus, ja, nu is het beter. Ja, nu weet ik het weer. Ja, ja, dat doet je vast ook ook stressen. Ja. Ja, ja, leuk. En nu nog een keer. Ja, nu nog een keer. Oké, okay, maar wat zeg ik? Als het dus kut, dus doen we het nog een keer. Ja, okay. Nee, ja, duidelijk. Ja, ja. Oh, leuk. Ja. Nice. Hoe laat zit het? Ja, we hebben nog echt uh, 30 seconden of zo. Misschien de helikopter. Ik doe nog even 30 seconden en dan is 17 en half. En dan even de afronding in de hand. Dan moet ik nou even binnen 10 minuten afronden, dus zet de timer al even neer. Ja, hoe je dat ik Nee, het, la- het laatste gedeelte is zo doorheen. Ja, ik zo doorheen Ik ben niet door, ik ben niet van die zomer. Ja, ik gooi hem nu vast. Alright, we can put the label down. Um, I'm pretty sure you didn't get to finish. Uh, no longer. That's actually pretty far, by the way. Um, so, if I would have just given you the manual and the Lego, I'm pretty sure within 3 4 minutes you would have done it. And I think this shows that if you have a visual impairment and you can't do this for yourself, you have to rely on others, um, that is pretty hard. And I think exercises like these create some empathy uh, for people with disabilities, uh, impairments. And I think that empathy does way more for accessibility than a legal obligation will ever do. Um, Because as good as legal obligations are for accessibility, like you get a minimum line of what you have to comply to, um, accessibility will also have limited uh, by legal obligations, will have its downsides. Um, so within the uh, WCAG guidelines, there are three levels. I think we all know them. It's A, it's double A, and it's triple A. It's really complex, I guess. Um, and Government agencies are legally required to comply to the AA standards. Uh, private businesses will also have to do this starting next year. Um, so this means that there is a higher level, AAA, that's actually considered more strict for accessibility and will therefore be create more uh, accessible websites, that we said no, AA is good enough. Um, The problem with legally saying uh, that you have to do something without explaining why you have to do it is that you will do it for a bare minimum. Um, I kind of lost what I was going to say, but we'll get to that later. (laughs) So, AAA guidelines, what I talked about, there are some really strict rules, like you have a way higher contest ratio than the AA standards. You have to have sign language in all videos and extensive audio description with the same videos. And these are pretty strict. I can understand what I said, like, okay, maybe that's a bit too much. But the double A guidelines, the triple A guidelines, also have some guidelines that say you have to use section headings to organize content. You have to have a clear link text that's understandable out of context. So you can't say click here to download. You have to say download the instructions or something like that. And you can't have images with text inside it. I think these guidelines we can actually incorporate in our day-to-day business. These these aren't hard to do, but we don't because we're getting told 
that, or we don't, or most of the times we don't, because we're getting told that double A is good enough. So if you get told to do double A, you look at the double A requirements and do those. You won't look at the triple A requirements and say, wait a minute, but half of these we can incorporate anyway. That's easy. Um, so basically, why would you do this if you're not legal, legally required to do? Um, so the bare minimum, I have it in quotes because I know I'm exaggerating, uh, but the bare minimum is good enough and there is little incentive to do more. Um, so that also means that we're going to operate within the legal wiggle room that the guidelines give us. It turns out that since the introduction of the WCAG guidelines, uh, website designs have been uh, becoming more grayish and less contrast. It does this some of the times. Um, than what we've been doing for ages with books, like black and white. Um, which is not strange at all, because when you enforce a contrast of at least 4.5 to 1, 4.5 to 1 is good enough. And whether it's going to be black or gray, both comply to the guidelines. Um, I can show you an example. Uh, the top one is a piece of text, which has a contrast of 4, 5 to so barely needs explanations, uh, while the bottom one is black. And when you look at it quickly, you can read them both, they both comply, but when the text will be longer, the top one will be way more of a strain for your eyes than the bottom one. So there is a difference, both comply, but you could have been more accessible taking the bottom one, but you don't have to. So we're fine with the, with the top one. Um, let me take you back to digitogankelijk.nl. This is not the footer of digitogankelijk. This is what I made of the footer from digitogankelijk, which is black and white and has the best contrast you can get. Meanwhile, the real footer is dark gray on light gray, which has a lower contrast, is less visible uh, than if you would just do black on, on white. If you would do black and white, you'd even comply to 7 to 1 from the triple A uh, contrast requirements. Um, and to completely turn this into a small mindfuck, it also doesn't help that when it comes to public contracts, the guidelines itself uh, make it more inaccessible. Um, there is one contrast to rule them all for small text, you have to have 4.5 to 1. Uh, it's a really linear calculation, uh, which really doesn't work with the non-linear uh, view of the human eye. Uh, this is why for some colors the contrast is completely off, most notable in blue and uh, orange. I'm going to give you an example. Out of these two, who thinks the white on blue, the right one, is more readable? Who thinks the black on blue is more readable? White fails with a way too low contrast, while the black is more readable. It's more notable than orange. Anyone says black and orange is more readable? But it's the only, effect, only one of the two that actually passes the weekend guidelines. This is not only, well, most notable in blue or orange, but not only in those colors. Here, we have black and purple that passes with the right contrast, while the one above there will fail. So there has been a complete research about this, these are the results. Um, which is pretty much a problem, because you think you're doing the correct thing by following guidelines and being as accessible, uh, accessible as possible, while in some instances you're making it more inaccessible. So, I have five minutes left. In closing, when we keep seeing uh, accessibility as a legal requirement, uh, something we are forced to do, then we will never understand why we do it. And if we never understand why we do it, we will never try to do better than a bare minimum. Then we will just get our reviews, be happy with our paper accessibility. Or we could do way more than that. Uh, we can accept that our work has a huge impact on our users, uh, especially those with impairments. We can start understanding that the legal obligations and the weekend guidelines are a starting point and not a mediocre end goal. And if we can do that, we can aim for true accessible websites and not just accessibility on paper. That was it, just a small thing. Um, downstairs we have a stand uh, outside. 
uh, I brought our starting accessibility experience lab uh, with me. Understand you can try different visual impairments just to get a few and create some empathy as to what the different visual impairments do to people. We also have uh, gloves that simulate motor impairments. Uh, please try them if you want to use it on uh, laptops or mobile phones and see how that feels. Um, and I would like to thank you very much for coming today, for participating in the exercise, everyone. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But are there? <laughs> <laughs> Got three minutes left. Yeah, so in the contrast you showed, it seems like all the white ones are very low. This one? Yes. I'm referring to it, it's very low. There is a uh, light with the white. Yeah, there is a problem with um, the linear approach to what now the contrast ratio is. Um, fails to incorporate uh, um, the effect uh, background colors have on especially the white color. So indeed it will happen that where white is more visual because of the background, white on orange is just more visual, but in a linear approach to color contrast, um, that will fail because it doesn't take into consideration the background uh, of, of the text. Do they have alternatives? There, um, there is in probably the uh, next guidelines from WCAG, the 3.0, there will be, uh, or at least that's a proposal, uh, a new form of uh, contrast calculations, the APCA. Uh, I'm pretty sure there was a, hey, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a, a conference about digital accessibility where they continue to talk about the new color contrast. But there is, there's there's things coming to fix it. So slowly, we'll get there. Because that's, I think, easier to understand. Like, yes. close your eyes. This is this is really hard. Yeah. While you, yeah. So there's not really a way for other people to experience the anxiety or yeah. the stimulation. That yeah. Deal with. Okay. I mean, I can, I can, I can give a, uh, I can give a, a little bit of an approach because I have uh, hearing amplifying headphones. Me, <laughs> where you just hear anything in the other room. Uh, but if that's really it, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's way more difficult to, to actually feel how, how that would be than visually impaired. So I, I do indeed agree that the underlying problem there is that it's also on deaf and visually impaired mostly. Yeah. Well, there is a bigger group of people that actually have the, the attention disorders. The, yeah. yeah. Cool. It's uh, time. So again, thank you very much, and I'll see you downstairs.